Great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so today is uh, May Day or International Workers Day. And um, we had this, this idea at our last global meetup two months ago to um, center this meetup around the topic of migration and, and um, labor, kind of to celebrate the day. Um, um, so thank you for uh, the presenters today who are sharing some of their work around around those themes. Um, and Eleni is also going to be co-hosting today too. Um, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and presenting a project. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, so um, if you if you want to, if you're if you're interested in it, um, last time we we had a, a background challenge where you could post up your uh, a river that was close to your house. Um, and today or today we were thinking about what could we do as a fun background. Um, so we thought about flags. But then as I haven't talked to you about this, Eleni, yet, but yeah. I'm thinking, you know, fl flags can be kind of like charged and yeah. or maybe not feel like, right? No, and we're going to talk about immigration. You don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I was wondering if we it could like expand the idea of a flag and just really talk about home, like home wherever your, your, yeah. your place is right now, uh, whatever is resonating with you in terms of home, whether that's close to where you are now or far away from where you are now. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm coming from, from Denver, Colorado. I moved here last summer. Um, so a few things before we get started, I just wanted to um, let you know that we are recording this event um, so that we can post it on, on YouTube afterwards. Um, I also just wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Now that's hard to do when you have a global event um, but if you want to just uh, drop, uh, you know, the the original inhabitants of of whatever land you're you're on in the chat, or or just take a moment to think about, um, you know, the legacies of of migration and displacement um, that have brought us to where we are today. Um, now is a good time to do that. Um, so our agenda for the day. Um, <clears throat> We're gonna, we have a, um, this is special in that we have former faculty members, uh, Papa Nicholas, uh, who's gonna give us a, a lecture. Um, so we're gonna have 10 minutes for Zeis to um, share his topic today. Um, and then we'll have two uh, uh, presenters or artists who are sharing um, some of their projects. We have Eleni um, Esarhu. Esarhu, whatever. Esarhu and uh, Sandra Ramos. Um, presenting some really interesting work. So we'll have five minutes for, for both of them to present. Um, and five and have, a half. Five and a half. Okay. An me. extra 30 Thank seconds. You. Um, we can totally do that. So then we'll have <laughs> 19 and a half minutes for group discussion. <laughs> after, wait, no, no, sorry. sorry. Times no. two is 19. 19 minutes after the presentations okay. uh, for discussion. Um, and also just um, something to remember for if you're looking for for feedback as, as one of the presenters, um, just start out by by sharing like what what questions you have, um, you know what what kind of what kind of feedback you're looking for, just to give um, everyone a chance to think about it as you're as you're talking. Um, Eleni, did you have anything else you wanted to add before you? No, I just yeah. wanted to to say this, but uh, I wanted to say that I'm really moved and, you know, today that we are here with uh, this Papa Nicolas after all these years, teacher and uh, great friend. So let's start. I don't want, uh, I don't want to say something else. Now I will say later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's great too that we have you know a former instructor, an alum, yeah. and a current MFA student too. Like it's it's just great that you know, that we we have this this um, this community kind of sharing thoughts together. So take it away, Zees. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you for inviting me. Uh, 
I don't often, <laughs> I've got my stopwatch here. I don't often uh, get a chance to uh, meet with a lot of Art Institute students or ex Art Institute students. Uh, I've got a couple that I see now and then. Uh, what, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, uh, some research I did in the book that came out of it uh, about uh, a Greek immigrant uh, labor organizer and uh, his involvement in a very uh, violent bloody strike in Colorado in 1913 and 1914. But what I'm going to uh, focus on is, uh, a you know, the message uh, for artists. And it's uh, significant that it's on May Day, International Workers' Day, because uh, we have to remember that artists uh, are workers too. And, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, have to have uh, day jobs to keep the lights on in the studios. But even uh, if you're fortunate enough to be able to devote all of your time uh, to your art, uh, you have to remember that art, making art itself, I think is, uh, is a political activity because the minute you pick up a paintbrush or uh, uh, plug into the internet or uh, take your camera out of the case, uh, you're uh, really making a political statement. You're voting on uh, the values of your culture or you're voting against them or you're voting yes on some and no on others. So at that moment, you are in, involved both as a, as a kind of worker uh, and uh, in a larger political world. And that's what I learned when I started working on this book. I started out as a creative writing uh, student uh, and got my master's degree in creative writing. And one day I was looking along, uh, looking for something to write about in this program. And since both my parents came from industrial towns in Utah, my mother from a coal mining area, I thought, well, maybe I'll write about a mine strike. That, you know, is something that has a lot of interest. So I was foraging around in the library and I came across this event, the Ludlow Massacre. I never heard about it before. And how on uh, April 20th, 1914, a group of uh, tents of striking workers were uh, invaded and burned down by the Colorado National Guard and a number of, uh, of striking miners were shot. Among them, someone who was called Louis the Greek, Louis Ticas, and he was the unofficial mayor of this town. So I got interested in this. And at the end of the, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, in a minute, but uh, at the end of the, the project, what I had learned about Louis Ticas could really be put on a three by five filing card. There wasn't, uh, I found some significant things. So the issue was, what am I going to do with this? Uh, am I going to just uh, leave it as a kind of a, uh, a footnote to the mining histories that had been written. Uh, and what I began to realize was that what I was interested in was the holes that this man left in history. Not what I knew about him, but, but, but the absences, the silences. And uh, I, uh, you know, I had friends that I talked to who were writers. They said, well, why don't you just make up stuff? You know, just use the bare bones of this and, and write a novel. Well, I guess I could have done that. But what, what intrigued me is what was it about our history? What was it about our culture in America that left this immigrant worker uh, three or four lines of a biography, even after I'd gone all over Colorado trying to find old time of black miners who knew about it. And 
So I decided to call my book Buried on Sun. Uh, one of the things that the Greeks in the United States really worried about of that era was that they would die in a lonely mining town or uh, railroad camp, and they would be buried without having uh, a priest come and sing them, you know, do the Greek Orthodox burial uh, ceremony over them. But in a sense, Louis Chikas, although he did get, you know, a, a priest came down from Denver and buried him. Uh, but in a sense, because there's so little known about him, he was unsung in our history, as were all of the uh, uh, immigrant labor organizers, immigrant workers uh, of that era who died in camps and mining explosions, uh, in industrial accidents. Uh, what do we know about them? And uh, I always say, uh, you know, Louis Tikas now has a statue in Denver and all that. Uh, you know, people read my book, that's good. Uh, but we have to remember that there was an Italian Louis Tikas, and we don't know what his name was, uh, an Italian labor organizer. There was uh, a Lithuanian coal miner. There, you know, there was a Chinese labor organizer. Uh, there's a whole history of people who lived and died in America, immigrant workers, workers who maybe had been in this country for generations and generations who were unsung. And so that's why the whole uh, became interesting to me. Why was that? Um, so what I discovered was that in order to, 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 to flesh this out, I could use my skills uh, whatever they were, as a creative writer to make the story more than just a few lines on a piece of paper, to make it emotional, to have a kind of resonance, a resonance and a kind of politics to it. And I found myself adopting uh, an old uh, form, and that's a detective story. And so the story, it doesn't focus on me, but it focuses on how I went about uh, trying to find out what I did. And I spent summers in Colorado interviewing old timers uh, about uh, what they knew about Louis Tikas and the mine strike. People had actually been there. They're all in their 80s. A lot of them had died, which was tragic. Uh, I'd say, oh, you know, you ought to go talk to Joe Stippett. She was there. He knows all about it. And then Oh, Joe, he died three years ago. He died, he died a week ago. Uh, so that was, uh, that was sad. But those that I met, their stories were so powerful and so moving. And I have to say it changed my life. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what I found out. Uh, Louis Tikas was not his real name. I knew that it was probably shortened. His real name was... Elias Anastasios Pantazakis, and he was born uh, in a little village in the island of Crete. And I was able to go there and see his house. And I found in the basement of the house uh, uh, an olive press, uh, you know, uh, uh, a millstone and another stone above it that. Uh, a, a donkey or a mule or horse would slowly turn around and crush the olives to bring the oil out. That was, you know, they had these things in the Stone Age. And this is what Louis Tikas knew of industry when he came to the United States, just like so many other uh, immigrants. And he was immediately thrust in to you know, at that time, the greatest industrial country in the world. Uh, he, uh, we don't know much about what he did. He had a little coffee house in Denver on Market Street. Uh, and uh, that's the first time I know anything definite about him before he left Greece. And then he was called by a group of Greek miners to go up to the mines uh, outside of uh, Boulder 
uh, which was a coal mine district of that, because they'd gone up there as scabs, uh, in other words, strike breakers, and they didn't know what to do because they were being held virtually prisoner. And Louis went up there. I don't know whether he went up there and got in the mines himself as a strike breaker or whether he just tried to help them. But at any rate, he went into the mine and led them all out and they joined the United Mine Workers uh, Union. And he became a full-time labor organizer uh, and translator for the United, Work United Mine Workers. And this was about 1910 uh, or 12. Uh, he worked organizing Greeks in the mines. He ended up in Southern Colorado where uh, the strikers were organizing against uh, mines largely owned by John D. Rockefeller uh, and his son, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. And the conditions were horrible. These camps were enclosed there were brutal mine guards who kept anyone from coming in uh, because they didn't want labor organizers coming in. Uh, they were acting essentially as an occupying army. The miners felt they were being cheated at the scales. They were paid by the ton of coal. Eventually, uh, they decided to strike. Uh, Mother Jones, one of the great uh, labor leaders in this country. See, I'm giving you all the assignments if you don't know this history. You, you know, get on the internet and look up Mother Joan. Uh, uh, look up the Colorado strike of 1913-14. There are wonderful uh, photographs of the strike. Uh, but at any rate, the, the miners walked out. Uh, they knew they'd be evicted from their company houses. And so they set up camps at the uh, uh, at the base of the canyons where the, the mines were. The mines were all up these little canyons and they'd set up camps. Uh, and the reason for the camps, well, the miners and their kids uh, had to have somewhere to live, uh, but also to try and control discouraged strike breakers from going up into the camps and working to keep the mines open. Uh, very bitter winter. All through the winter, they lived in these camps. Imagine if you were a little kid. Uh, kids today, you know, they're complaining because they have to have online uh, classes because of the COVID. How would you like to be a kid, a uh, miner's kid, and having to walk to a camp uh, through three feet of uh, snow uh, to go to school? Well, that was what the conditions were like. In the spring, the strike was still going on. And April 19th was Orthodox Easter. And uh, the Catholics and the Protestants had had an Easter celebration the week before. And the 45 or 50 Greeks decided, well, we'll have to outdo them. So they you know, got a couple of barrels of beer. They had uh, some wine. Uh, they, <laughs> as my friend Gus Papadakis, uh, one of the miners who was there said, we procured some lambs uh, <laughs> and uh, they had a celebration. There were baseball games. Uh, the women played the men. And of course, the women were all, uh, uh, the young women had all been kind of born in this country. And of course, they beat the pants off all of these immigrants who didn't know, you know, uh, which end of the baseball bat to hold. And it was a great day. And in the evening, some National Guardsmen came around and uh, caused some trouble. Uh, no one knew what was going to happen. The next day, uh, shooting started. Uh, the National Guard put two machine guns, covered the camp. The miners took their weapons, uh, mostly shotguns, as it turns out, to try and draw the fire of these National Guard machine guns uh, in, in case they started shooting into the camps, which they did. Uh, that evening, April 20th, uh, the National Guard invaded the camp, set fire to the tents, captured Louis Ticus, who was the unofficial mayor of the Kent city of about, oh, I don't know, over a hundred, uh, over a hundred people in it. 
captured him and two other union men, forced them to run and shot both, all of them in the back. The next morning, people came. The tent city was in ruins. Nothing but burned tents and cook stoves were left. And in a cellar underneath one of the tents, they found two women and 11 children had suffocated, been smothered because of the fire. And it was a horrible event. Uh, all sudden, Colorado erupted. There was a war for 10 days between the miners and uh, the company guards and the National Guard. And finally, federal troops came in, and that was the end of the Ludlow Massacre. And the Union was beaten. It was uh, almost completely destroyed. Its treasury was empty. Uh, it was uh, it raised horror uh, on people seeing what had happened in the newspaper. Uh, but essentially, uh, Colorado went back to being a non-union state. So what do I do uh, with this? Uh, what, 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 what's the purpose? What, what, you know, what, can, what can an artist do to tell this story? Uh, it's powerful on the, the page, but I wanted it to be more than that. I wanted to have an emotional re resonance and I wanted people to know uh, what it was like to talk to these old timers. Uh, and uh, what, uh, what that meant and what it means today. And I realized that uh, what I was doing was, was something that Franz Kafka talked about that an artist can do that maybe a, 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 a documentary historian can't do. Because like, Kafka says, a work of art is like an ax that breaks up the frozen sea within us. And I think that that's what we're all trying to do, whether we're doing something that's strictly aesthetic or something that has some kind of social meaning uh, or something that has a combination of both, whatever it is, we're trying to somehow touch that frozen sea that all of us has, that emotional and psychological sea and make people see and make them feel. And so that's why I wrote the story uh, the way I did. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether I've used up my time, I probably have, but uh, uh, I guess we could talk about this later after we hear the two other presentations. Thank you so much, Zeese. I I had no idea you were going to present on on a Colorado book. I'm I'm so excited to to read this now because I I actually just this week went to the library and got you know these two Colorado River books. One uh -huh. is about life and death along the Colorado River um, because you know it supplies so much of the water in the western part of the United States. And this one's about a mining accident. That happened yeah, in yeah. No, you can uh, as I say. Uh, all of this stuff is uh, readily available on the internet. And there's some beautiful photographs and some there are interviews, uh, uh, and uh, it, it's worth looking at if you're at all interested in uh, this kind of social history. Great. So um, Zisa's book is called Buried Unsung. Um, I have dropped a link for it in the chat, and we're going to put it on the on the notes in the video too. Um, so next up, we have Sandra. Hi, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be, be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. Can I share my screen? Yeah, I think. Um, let me know if you're if you're having problems with it, and I'll I'll figure something out. Sorry. <laughs> ah. Well, um, I am a Cuban artist. I emigrated to United States in 2014. Uh, but, but since I graduated from the Higher Institute of Art in Havana in 1992, I, I always have been uh, reflecting in my work issues related to Cubans that emigrate through the Florida stretch. My work has to do a lot with the suffering of these people and the amount of life that have been lost on this uh, process. Uh, in some way, I think this relates to all kinds of emigration through the sea. Uh, and this 
many of these people have become the labor force in that have built important cities in in United States as Florida, as many cities in Florida, Tampa, Key West, and and Miami. Uh, all this body of war have to do with the rafter crisis in 1994. Uh, and in some way I made a, an embodiment of these uh, people and I represent uh, their hopes and also their frustrations and the dangers that going through the sea uh, means. Uh, to, I, I, I use many medias in this. I, I use photograph, painting, installation, video, and animation. And this is my more recent piece that is a. a, a I, I did this when Obama opened relations with Cuba. And it's a bridge between Havana and Miami made on light box installation with pictures that I took from the airplane. And the idea is that we are so so close geographically and at the same time so far because of policies and so it's a kind of metaphor that you can cross the bridge very easily and to finish i want to show you an animation that i did in 2008 that i seen in some way try to represent all immigration and the kind of chip break uh, uh, psychological chip break that means to the necessity to emigrate to another country. And that's all. If you have any question, I can answer it later after the presentation. Thank you so much, Sandra. It was it's so nice seeing. I, I, you, you shared the animation with me, and it's so nice seeing the, um, you know, the, some of your other other media that you, you that you've been using. Um, okay, Eleni, do you want to wrap us up with your presentation? Uh, can I share? Uh... Share whatever you want. All right. Okay. <sighs> Sorry, I don't know. Oh. Immigration is such a broad topic, and I really uh, hesitated of how I'm going to approach the project victim is a collective interactive project. It is an homage to all these people that lost their lives without being able to be mourned and buried decently by their loved ones. They were all buried and sung, if I can use this, this is Papa Nicola's uh, book title. 
Mourning is an act of love, and as an act of love, I see this, uh, this piece. Uh, by signing a toe tag uh, under the Greek phrase, Ella Vagnosi, which means I am aware, we show empathy. And it's like adopting a lost soul. We co-create, we can co-create the artwork and build a huge humanitarian web. And climate change is inextricably linked to population movement. Population movement is a very archaic human practice started two million years ago uh, when Homo erectus moved from Africa to Eurasia for a better life. If we all agree that basic human rights of justice, such as freedom and equality, should be global, then I'm asking, is it legitimate to immigrate? Is it legitimate for states to practice uh, this kind of power? Uh, is this the way we want to treat each other? And how this uh, tragic news become ephemeral? I want to, I really, I'm just wondering what the near future will bring for all of us if we don't act. I really want to shake this calmness and uh, I want to suggest another world. I want us to stop imprisoning people for uh, dealing with forcible displacement and the violation of human rights. There are so many uh, debates for the last three decades among political philosophers about the ethics of immigration. Uh, freedom and equality require states to maintain open borders and I cannot argue that this is the right thing. Uh, the literature available is immense. Sociologists, uh, anthropologists, political scientists, statisticians, legal specialists, historians, demographers, economists, uh, they have all contributed. So I'm not bringing something new to the table with what I've said, but I hope that I, I bring awareness uh, with my piece. Uh, these uh, pieces are randomly knitted with hand-painted uh, yarns, and it's a ritual. It's a repeated process. It imitates what's uh, happening globally with uh, people moving and losing their lives. Uh, I really wish, you know, and I hope that it will be a huge mobile with uh, the toe tags hanging, the signed ones, so people can go through and touch them and read them. And I really want to close reading this data. Over 18,000 children, migrant and refugee went missing in Europe between 2018 and 2020. Shame on us. From the beginning of 2021, in the US-Mexico borders, in the crowded shelters, uh, the children there increased from 380 to 3,500. Missing children for the last years in the US-Mexico borders are over 600. Uh, hundreds of thousands of children are on the move in the Southeast Asian migration route. Thousands of children are missing in the Southeast Asian migration route. That's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Eleni. It's been so um, good hearing all three of your, your perspectives on these very related topics of migration and labor and we we dived into a little bit of like history with 
this and i think there's there's a lot of like dreaming and uncertainty i think in 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 sandra's work and i i feel like in Lelini's work there's there's this question too of like how do we for those who don't make it who don't aren't able to migrate successfully how do we memorialize this and reflect on this um this tragedy um so now is our, our chance to talk about all the work. Is, does anyone have anything that's coming up for them? I I muted some people, so you may you may be on mute if you're trying to 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 speak. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. There. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I, I thought that uh, both of these things, that, you know, they're just uh, so so different in in the approach, uh, uh, but both of them had this, uh, you know, what I what I was what I was in my own clumsy way was trying to talk about. Uh, they really seek engagement of an audience, not just a kind of uh, passive looking uh, where you become a kind of a, a, a consumer uh, of someone else's thoughts or ideas. But uh, in, in, in Sandra's work, there's uh, all of these questions, especially in the, in the animation uh, that were asked. And it's, a, it's that kind of mysterious quality to it that you have to, uh, you know, uh, plunge, plunge yourself into it uh, intellectually. You've already had a kind of emotional uh, reaction to uh, uh, a woman made out of bottles and the bottles being thrown into the sea, you know, messages. Uh, what, are, what are the messages and what does it mean? And, and uh, do, they, uh, do they reach uh, the other shore. Are they trying to reach us? Are they trying to uh, reach another land? Uh, it, it's uh, it's it's on that kind of uh, edge where there are uh, kind of urgent questions and answers that uh, are not quite not quite given that we have to fill in. And of course, Eleni's is very different because it's so tactful. Uh, and my wife and I filled out some of these toe tags and it's kind of a chilling experience to write the name uh, or, or, or what's known of a, of a real uh, human being, especially a child, uh, name unknown, uh, origin, uh, you know, Eritrea, uh, where found Mediterranean Sea off Malta, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's powerful in, in that, in that respect. But I think that, you know, that, uh, that uh, frozen sea in both of these was being cracked open uh, for me. And, uh, you know, I found both of these things really, really strong. I, uh, um, I, it, it was really, so it was so, uh, intriguing to really hear the talk and, and see the, the pieces, um, the, the fascinating story that this was talking about and, and also the, the moving and striking pieces, both of Sandra and Eleni. Um, and I, I really, uh, I mean, you know, I immigrated myself uh, from Israel to the United States, and um, well, I, I think one thing that uh, I was thinking about how um, I, I'm basically, a, I guess, third generation of immigrants. You know, my, my grandparents immigrated in in Europe, and then um, my mother to what was at the time Palestine, um, and then became Israel. Uh, and I ended up myself also immigrating. Um, and one thing I was thinking about how 
uh, the world hasn't changed in the sense that, you know, during World War II, all, like everywhere in the world, there were immigration quotas. I mean, people were massacred in Europe, but then, you know, the democracies didn't, um, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, it was, it wasn't enough to kind of, um, to save people. Uh, and, and they have all those immigration quota in place. Um, and, and that hasn't changed at all, apparently. Uh, it's like no one learned anything. Um, and the other thing is like when, when I saw Sandra work, I, I really, it's, it's like, it, uh, resonated with me like so much. I, I, I was thinking about like I, how I have one of these bottles still in, you know, in my home country in Israel. I, I never managed to kind of uh, have all my bottles go, get to the, to the new shore where I landed. Uh, I still have a bottle there, uh, a piece of me as, and, and that was um, like, like an insight looking at your work. So yeah, thank you so much. I was also interested in um, Zeus, what you were starting to talk about with um, uh, artist labor, uh, just being a unique thing. And I, I wanted to put that out to the group to, to just talk about artist labor, like both your like your own artist labor, like how has that evolved <laughs> or like, how do you how do you see that really um, yeah, moving in your work, your labor? Well, of I think of course the immigration process changed uh, the way you develop your own work because you need to adapt as an artist to a new conditions, uh, sometimes new subjects, and. Um, new systems of relations that, that involve all, all the reference that you have in your work also and all that. But uh, what I want to talk uh, is more about the people that never emigrate and they stay with the desire and the hope to one day emigrate. That's, that's a part of the emigration that I think that people don't think a lot about. And I think it's very important. It's not only the people who 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 emigrate and succeed, succeed the people who emigrate and fail and die. That is so the the worst. But it's also the people that stay and have all your life waiting the moment and and hoping to emigrate. And in some way, I have seen this, and it's kind of a waste of time and life because they never really set up in the place where they are because they, I have seen that in many Cubans. They are waiting the moment and, and it's so, I think it's, it's some of the aspect that is not very well uh, studied and it's, for me it's very interesting that this living your life waiting to emigrate. In some way, I think that in the piece, the cheap rate uh, is, it, it have to do with this also, no? with the desire that people don't accomplish. I see this in, um, in Sandra's work. And of course, because she's, she saw this in Cuba, she's from Cuba. And I've seen uh, in all these projects a lot of, uh, that's why I'm talking about uh, the forcible displacement, because most of these people are forcibly displaced for one reason or the other. So this is really so unfair uh, because they have to move, they have to go to a different place and then they die for that reason. So for me, this is really, so unfair because there is a war, there is a persecution, there's poverty. Like uh, really, if you if you don't have to, uh, what to eat or if you don't have what to feed your kids, aren't you going to do something? You're going to go somewhere else. I don't know. Um, or if you are in war, 
you're gonna go, you're mm -hmm. gonna go someplace else. And then they end up being prisoners. Uh, can I chime in? Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think um, my parents, I, I emigrated to this from Greece when I was eight, eight years old. And um, I think people really need to realize is that nobody leaves their country because they want to. Their country, it's their family, it's what they grew up with. And it colors the lens, that displacement, it colors the lens of how you see your whole life going forward. And, I, you know, my parents' generation, I think, was probably the last generation that left Greece um, when there was no mass media. You know, a phone call to Greece cost a lot of money. So at that time, it was total cutoff. And um, just this sense of pain that, you know, is handed down to generation after generation. And in my case, a sense of anger, because I know it's, most of it is political. Most of these, I mean, if you, if you really want to end immigration, just take care of the underlying causes. It's that simple, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's what people have to realize. It's, you know, we, we have in the media the sense of everybody wants to come to America, everybody wants to go to Europe. Well, not everybody does want that. People are forced to do that for you know, various reasons. I mean, and there's, there's also class separation. I mean, you know, there's technical workers that want to come to the U.S. There's college educated people that want to come uh, for various reasons, but they're not necessarily uh, displaced by their homeland. It's a choice. Um, so when you hear that in the media, you sort of just have to realize it's not a choice, you know. I mean, that's very obvious, but you just have to keep reminding yourself because they make it seem like, you know, people are pushing to the, the, the goal, the milk and honey of, of the mm -hmm. West, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think the sad thing is that in those countries that people emigrate uh, from, they don't find a way to, to make meaning of their life because of political freedom, because of economics, but that's so sad that you cannot find your your way to live in your home. I think that's the worst experience. Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, uh, really agree. With, uh, am, am I, can you hear me? Yes. I, yes. I, I would really uh, agree with uh, Eleni. With the Eleni and Sandra sort of saying. Uh, that uh, it, that the that, that people uh, come to the United States for various reasons, but it doesn't mean that they really left their homelands. And I, I guess one step is, you know, why why are these uh, why are these borders? Uh, why do they exist? Why is it so difficult? For example. Uh, to visit Cuba, I, you know, my wife and I went a number of years ago, and uh, it, it uh, because of the, you know, ridiculous political battle between Cuba and the United States, uh, it was difficult to get there, and of course it was difficult for uh, Cubans to come in, and I think that if we just have a, a more chance to have free exchange uh, among people and that's a, that's a step in having uh, a, a bigger a, a greater emotional and intellectual in intellectual life uh, I don't know uh, I uh, I know that people have you know uh, not been able to come to the United States because of their political views for example and well, how how in the world will we get to know them or or understand them or uh, agree with them or argue uh, with them uh, if 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 we can't have these kinds of free you know free conversations? But I think that that's one of the things that that the arts especially do because uh, arts can somehow uh, artists can somehow evade or jump over or find ways around this. And the people that we saw in Cuba that seemed to be happiest were uh, 
a few uh, artists who were, who were able to, to travel to travel the world because of their uh, you know because of their music and uh, it, they were musicians mostly because of their because of their music. So I'd like to see more of that. I thought it was an interesting point um, that um, was brought up, just the immigration by force versus immigration by choice. Um, and that leads to like the idea also about both experiences, like um, still being far from your homeland, even if by choice and, you know, politically how, at least in the US, that plays out as far as a treatment of foreigners of immigrants of choice and by force, you know, there's kind of a political layer there. Um, and uh, in this feeling of being between worlds um, also um, that plays out. I mean, there's, this is such a, a great topic. And I mean, there's so many layers to the immigrants experience and then the generations um, of diaspora, you know, um, you know, of, of the generation, the, the kids of the direct immigrants, of, you know, and, and what their parents' experiences were and how you end up feeling some idea of home and knowing, you know, your own family's background or struggles or lack thereof. I mean, so it's, and then Ruth just brought up even some in chat in the chat, like the, the experience locally of, of that loss or shift of home. So, I mean, there's so many, there's so many ways to look at this topic. Um, I just wanted to highlight those ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, and, and, go, and go in, ahead. Relation, in relation with labor, I think it's so important to point also how many of these immigration that uh, uh, succeed in establishing in other countries in, need to support their families in their countries of origin. And in some way, they support also the government, the bad government that made them go mm. out uh, yeah. because it's an uh, economic source for to keep the establishment in this country but it's something that you need to do because if you have your family there what what else that's that's something that happened with many cubans also mm -hmm. and mexicans and people from africa yeah mm -hmm. so one so, one theme one theme i see in all three of your work is is preservation like with with these and your your oral histories and with Sandra, the 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 ship in the bottle kind of imagery, is like it seems to me something like you're preserving something, and then the you know also the kind of like memorializing in Eleni's work, it just makes me curious of like what what are you preserving and why? In my case, it has to do with communication. For me, the and in the case of the of the of the animation. The bottle symbolizes a message. Is is you become part of the message too, as an artist, as a person, as part of a society. For me, is uh, is the documentation. Is that I feel that they're less anonymous anymore, you know, and they're ne they're not a number. They're somewhere and that they had a decent burial in a way. And that the, the Mediterranean became a huge grave. It's really, you know, like uh, very tragic news, like uh, 400 people, you know, uh, got drowned yesterday. And then the next day it was like fine. Uh, it was in the news, 400 people, 90 people, 60 people, 70 people. It's like, like regular news. And that really struck me, that really, you know, like uh, uh, so weird, you know, and they were, uh, they were ephemeral, like it was uh, regular other news. So these 400 people, 70, 60, whatever, are, are not. They're people with lives and stories and families, and they existed. Mm -hmm. So that's for me, and plus awareness, because this doesn't stop. It's not a project for the past. 
I feel it's a project for the present and for the future, for awareness, mm -hmm. to do something about it, because that doesn't stop. And what I said, 18,000 children went missing. How do you announce this in Europe within two years? This data is in uh, the United Nations and the International Organization of Migration. Well, I think that uh, all of us in, in, in various, uh, you know, situations, we, we became artists in, for one reason, and that's because we had uh, some need to uh, express uh, something, you know, deep in us, and uh, we wanted to get it out. And I think that that, you know, that, that psychological experience of uh, whether it's a, a social uh, barriers, uh, whether it's political barriers, or just your own inability to, you know, to find your, to, to find your imagery, to find your voice, uh, to, to find how you're going to express yourself. We've had that that sense of uh, of being somehow constrained and maybe that is what uh, potentially gives us the ability to you know to reach a broader audience and and uh, and connect with uh, with immigrants uh, uh, who uh, are either forced to leave their country or want a better life for their children uh, but I, but uh, I, I think that you know that we we have to use the the tools that uh, that we've been given to do this. I want to ask uh, Sandra: Do you go back to Cuba uh, frequently? Or are you able? To yeah, go I I go fre frequently. My parents are there. My sister, my brother. Uh -huh. and I, this year, I have been able to go because of the COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now it's a very critical situation in Cuba, not only because of the COVID, because of also the repression against artists. Now there is oh. a big artist, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, who is in in, a, in hunger stray. Uh, there have been a lot of problems recently oh. with yeah. artists, and yeah. Well, that's it was very good during the time of Obama. It was a time of hope in the openings of Cuba and a better yeah. situation, but now it's. Like terrible. Yeah. Well, I can remember uh, one of the, I bought a little piece by a Cuban artist and I think it, uh, it, it, it seemed to me to really represent something. And it was just a series of, you know, uh, gas balloons, beautifully done. It was an, an engraving floating up over the ocean. <laughs> and uh, after talking with this, guy for five minutes I realized exactly what he was what he was saying you know it's uh, the spirit needs to needs to needs to fly it needs to float mm -hmm. whether it's across oceans or just across uh, you know the, the the wall that separates you from your neighbors mm -hmm. um, I want to jump in just to um, give space for anyone who wants to um, share any announcements or um, right, and um we're we're more than welcome to just keep chatting afterwards mm -hmm. um so i, I don't want to don't want to end this conversation prematurely but if anyone has any announcements please share yeah go ahead beth hi um thank you yeah i just wanted to put out the announcement um that sfaa uh is is putting out a call today or perhaps tomorrow on the website um accepting from or you know the SFA community um, submissions for uh, art, of artwork surrounding this topic of labor and immigration, and um, we'll we'll be sending it out through a newsletter announcement. But it enables artists, alums, um, or extended you know faculty community of, of uh, the SFA community to submit work that'll be featured um, on our Instagram platform. And on June 19th, we're gonna have another great little discussion on Zoom um, featuring five of the artists who've submitted and welcoming everybody whose work um, will be shown. Uh, so we'll be showing the work on the Instagram platform through the end of June. 
um, and uh, it's not juried, so we're going to try to fit in everybody who's submitting work, um, submitting images or video. So look out for that. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I, I mentioned a couple of times during this meetup that the idea for this um, meetup came from the last one. So if anyone has ideas about um, themes they'd really be interested in seeing our, you know, our community present, um, would love to hear those ideas. Well, uh, before we sign up, I just want to, you know, thank you again. And uh, Shokai and uh, Eleni, you know, you can uh, put out my emails. You both have it uh, to anyone who is in the Zoom. And if you want to uh, write me about anything or ask me about anything, I'm, I'm happy to reply. Uh, so, uh, you know, but keep, you know, we can keep up the, the conversation you know, uh, in that way. Great. Great. Yeah, I'll definitely after after this meeting's over, I'm gonna I'm gonna write everyone just a a follow up email with with links to everyone's site and and um, yeah, I, I hope that we can all stay in touch. Um, with that, I I wanted to um, you know, just. Uh, also mentioned that SFAA is an independent 501c3 now, and um, we can accept donations. Um, so if this conversation was inspiring to you, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a great community for, for sharing ideas, and I just encourage you to consider um, giving what you can if you can. Um, so yeah, I mean, is there, are there, <laughs> now that we've gotten the announcements out of the way, um, where should we, where should, where should, where should, where should we jump back in? I have an idea. I wanted to just kind of, um, point out or something that I've been thinking about a lot is just how much climate change impacts every aspect of what we're talking about including COVID and migration and, you know, all those issues and how that's just going to continue over the years, you know, as we move forward and it's impacting all living species, including humans. And, um, you know, we're seeing what Eleni was talking about with the, you know, mass deaths in the Mediterranean with, you know, I think, I won't go on about this because it's horrifying, but you know, they, I just saw something where bird species have declined 30% in the last, I don't know, few years. I mean, definitely in, in the last decade or so, um, which is, it's really shocking. And, you know, I mean, it's something that we have to face, have our eyes open and really be, you know, it's like a Buddhist practice to be here in the present and perceiving these things and not hide and, and not, you know, allow it to crush us either. And, and that is so challenging and it's part of our life's work. And as artists, you know, um, some of us really do work that's specifically about that and others um, incorporate it in different ways in their work and their practice. Something I've been thinking re related to that is this whole field of behavior change and behavior change design and behavior science. Um, I'd be interested to know, like, to see artists who are who are really focused on changing behaviors like that. Like, I mean, because with climate change, it's just it's all about behavior, <laughs> and, and it's uh, it's so baked into our entire economy and like. Uh, you know, our movement and the way we live. Yeah. <laughs> the way we decide to to go about our lives. Yeah. And what we teach, you know, because uh, is what we how we raise like, our kids and uh, what we do for. Uh, the kids, you know, and that will be adults, you know, very soon, and they will behave, you know, the way we are. 
what are we what are we doing through education and what are we doing as parents to do to change something there's no other way there is a way <laughs> for states to do something you know uh, to take serious all this situation but other than that if we want to do things it's through schools education through parenting changing the things you know for the little ones uh, one one thing it's uh, uh i also uh i just wanted to bring is that uh, um I guess we're we're a little bit. It, it looks like we are uh, like in the what we call the de the developed country of the West. We are a little bit. Uh, I think became blind to the, the, the cynical aspect of, you know, we trust uh, people from, you know, people to build all all our product products, you know, anywhere from anywhere in the world. But then uh, we we will not allow them to to cross the border and like physically be here and uh, it's uh, there's something really cynical about it I think. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask Lise a question. Um, why do you think labor history is so obscured? whether it was a hundred years ago or today? Well, it's um, in the United States, I know it, it's uh, for, for a number of reasons. One, uh, we have this uh, mythology uh, that uh, it's the individual that is responsible for uh, their own well-being and uh, that this is the place the united states is this uh open open slate where you can write your own destiny on it and of course labor means people uh getting together and and cooperating and uh it's uh you know groups of people in an industry or uh in in a in a, in a particular uh line of work that are really battling against a, a, a mythology of, uh, you know, the great man or the great woman or the great person who has uh, founded an empire uh, and through their own brilliance and genius, you know, uh, the, the Bezoses and, you know, the Elon Musk and people like that. And, you know, not to take anything away from the skills they have, but they have thousands and thousands and thousands of people working for them who are also human beings. Uh, so labor history, and it's been tainted by a kind of uh, fear that any kind of cooperative activity, oh, this is going to be communism, it's going to lead to dictatorship. Uh, it, uh, but in fact, uh, labor, labor unions are one of the bastions of democracy uh, in this country. And of course they do have their own uh, corrupt leaders and entrenched leadership, but they can also be tossed out. So I think that that's one of the reasons why uh, people, you know, there's a, there's, there, it's been played down in the textbooks, uh, labor history, uh, it uh, often doesn't exist. It, uh, even in the arts. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's quite com complicated. That's a kind of partial answer. But one of the things that's interesting, you know, you can go to the site of the Ludlow massacre today. There's a, you know, there's a monument and a statue and you can see where this uh, horrible event happened, but there's a little box and you open it up and there's a guest book, people who've been there and they write their names and you go through it. And it, so many of them say, Gee, I never heard about this in school. Why didn't they teach us this? Mm. Or, you know, I even, I've been a union member for 20 years. I never knew anything about this. So, uh, 
it's uh, you know, there whole there are whole areas of life that we don't know anything about. And the idea, and I think that you know, to skip to the art institute, I think that that was so wonderful uh, to be at the art institute, which uh, when I came there in '63 was uh, a haven uh, for gay and trans and transgender people, and that was a that was a barrier that uh, was broken by a community of artists, you know, uh, uh, in, at a at a time when uh, you know so much uh, prejudice was available in the outside community. So, in a sense. Uh, you know these these communal activities, uh, even of support, are are uh, well they're essential, especially today. It's kind of a long, <laughs> windy answer to your question. So I just finished um, the reading a book about the history of the 1921 Tulsa massacre. Oh yeah. And the author kind of ends it, uh, the book with this, like talking about this conspiracy of silence that um, after this tragedy, like ver like virtually the next day, White Tulsans just moved on. And, and there was this fear of, um, I was speaking about it because it could happen again. And I wonder how much that, that, plays into this like the fear of this the of a tragedy happening again to these like blank spots in history that then we have to kind of like do extra work to to go back and reclaim like i think the tulsa massacre didn't even have a, a an official account from oklahoma until the 1990s <laughs> like almost 100 years so yeah well we have this idea and this in the United States, and, and this is very true of other countries, that, uh, you know, you don't wash your dirty linen in public. And uh, I think it's uh, absolutely the, the opposite is really what happens that, you know, you keep the, it's just, it's just like having a, it's just like having a secret in your life. You keep it bottled up inside you and, and it leads to, uh, it leads to disease, it leads to dysfunction. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that, that, that artists do is they try and open up these secrets and let us look at them and, uh, and, and bring them into the light. Yeah, because we're always those people that, that try to have, at the, at the party, try to have the deep conversation and skip the small talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I have to leave, but I want to thank you again all for uh, having me having me on. And uh, again, you know, uh, feel free to drop me a line if you have any thoughts or you know questions or whatever. Okay. Well, thanks again. I'm going to just so sign. So great up. to see bye -bye. you.